The way we make things is changing, radically. A new set of ideas and trends have emerged and combined to create a new industrial revolution, one led by people and human innovation. They're using ideas like collaborative design teams and leaner, more customizable manufacturing. Once upon a time, a factory made one thing. Now, a factory can make almost as many things as there are people to imagine them. From Crema Media in Johannesburg, this is the Real Economy Report. Rhino conservation initiative Saving the Survivors has received more than 3 million rand from Dubai-based air services provider Donata, part of the Emirates Group, to acquire and operate a rhino ambulance. Oma Fenta has the story. The ambulance, which consists of a 4x4 vehicle and trailer, is equipped with a rooftop tent, generator, surgical instruments, endoscope, as well as ultrasound and x-ray equipment. The ambulance will help saving the survivors, based at the University of Pretoria's Faculty of Veterinary Science, to treat the survivors of rhino poaching incidents. Saving the Survivors co-founder, Dr. Johan Mare, explains the need for the rapid rescue vehicle. Uh, we started this project about two years ago, called Saving the Survivors, and we quickly realized that it's very important to have the right equipment to actually go out and treat survivors. If we look at the statistics, it's about one out of five animals, you know, survive. And now we're talking about snaring incidents, we're talking about poaching, where they immobilize the animal or shoot them and they don't die and they hack off the horn. These tremendous, you know, mutilations, or where they just get shot, you know, in the leg, often in the leg or in the body. Um, and then we also treat calves. You know, a lot of calves that, let's say, are with a mum and the mum died and, uh, you know, they get pneumonia or they also get injured in this whole poaching in incident, we also treat them. The ambulance will have two benefits, says Murray. So I think us, our success rate will, you know, first of all go up. And second of all, what is very important is nobody knows anything about rhino. The only thing that is published in the literature is actually the reproductive system. Nobody knows how the head looks inside, nobody knows the anatomy of the limb, nobody knows really how the abdomen looks inside, where the nerves run, where the blood vessels run. And by treating these animals, we get to know that anatomy as well, so that we can more successfully you know, treat them in, in the future. We're obviously doing research here as well, you know, but all these Heat and miss, I can almost say, you know, treatments help us tremendously to understand the anatomy. Like, you know, just yesterday we actually operated a cow, a three-year-old cow that weighed one ton, that had a fracture in her leg because of a bullet wound. Um, so all these things help us to understand, you know, the species much better so that we can better treat them in the future. Of course, the amount we're losing currently, over a thousand, is just not sustainable. The increasing rate of rhino poaching in South Africa and Africa affects economic growth opportunities in the hunting industry. As a result, the Ichikowitz Family Foundation and defense and aerospace manufacturer Paramount Group recently unveiled its anti-poaching skills and canine training academy in Michalisburg in an effort to mitigate the impact of rhino poaching on the continent. Zandile Mavuso has the story. On November 26, Defense and Aerospace Manufacturer Paramount Group and the Ichikovitz Family Foundation held a media event at its Anti-Poaching Skills and K-9 Training Academy in Machalisburg, where it created real-life assimilations of different stages and processes of anti-poaching and K-9 training. Members of the media were taken through different stages of training that both the dogs and their handlers go through. Ichikovitz Foundation Director Eric Ichikovitz explains the importance of having a healthy dog handler relationship. The handler relationship with the actual dog is of critical importance. It's a symbiotic re relationship and a relationship that, that improves with time because it's the fundamental element of trust that actually develops between the two that determines the success of the, of, of, of the, of the partnership.
Ichikofits further highlights the different type of systems they employ to train and prepare the dogs and their handlers for any type of poaching that they may encounter. Well, essentially it's about creating a, an, an environment where they, they, they bond. So we put them through a number of different exercises where they develop that relationship and we tax them. So they, they're put through a number of different exercises where they learn to develop that trust. And those exercises are both tracking exercises, the engagement exercises, the exercises that are, that are there to develop both the man skills as well as the dog skills. Well, the man skills are everything from basic tracking training to bush skills to animal behavioral skills to shooting skills. Everything that's required to develop proper anti-poaching skills in, 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 an, in a bush environment. The dog skills are fundamental dog, dog training skills um, depending on the dog, uh, what we're deploying the dog for. So if it's purely just detection skills, then it's primarily orientated towards teaching the dog how to scent for particular, for particular elements. Um, explosives, contraband, wildlife contraband, um, drugs, etc. But if it's more tracking skills, then it's teaching them concentration, not to get distracted by the odd impala that crosses its path, but to stay on human scent. Um, if it's bite work, then teaching it how to actually bite, where to bite, bite for maximum effectiveness, how to actually um, bite and put pressure to keep a suspect on the ground, etc. Not being accustomed to chasing after poachers, K9 Training Academy CEO Henry Ostazen explains the importance of choosing the right breed dog to train for anti poaching activities. Choosing the right dog is absolutely um, critical to the success of, of um, the dog unit going out. So, looking at that, to have a successful team on the ground needs specialized breeding. 50% genetics and 50% what you do with that genetics. So the selecting of the right breeding stock, the selection of the right puppies. Now we're in a very fortunate position that we do not have to force a dog to do something that it's not capable or suited to do. Because we have a, 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 a big clientele, we can actually look at each puppy individually and select what it, it excels in doing, what it loves doing. As you just saw a dog jumping out of a chopper, repelling out of a chopper, you cannot force a dog to do that. It must be natural in the dog. So we have dogs that's got that capabilities and we have other dogs that are docile, highly driven, but more suited for detection work. So we're in a very, very um, special position to actually look at each individual and get the best out of that individual. Urs Tazen goes on to highlight the dogs that are used at the K9 Training Academy, which are best receptive to anti-poaching tactics. For, for specialized operations and anti-poaching, the Belgian Malinois has been proved to be one of the best suited breeds for that type of work due to their high work ethics, endurance, and their high drive and need to please its handler. But we also do train German Shepherds in this facility and breed them as well. With a lot of technicalities being involved in anti-poaching techniques, Osthazen explains why dogs are the preferred animals for anti-poaching. Well, if we look at, at dogs um, and its use in society, dogs have been proven over and over, over millenniums, that it is still man's best friend and its desire to assist its humans has gone way beyond the call of duty. Dogs have been actively used in war since man can remember. And it's the skill of the dog and its capabilities that the humans are only now, in the 21st century, realizing that a fight like anti-poaching um, or Al-Qaeda or any of these uh, terrorist um, scenarios, the dog is still one of the most effective tools in combating crime. The nose knows. <laughs> Uh, it's been proven that the dog's sense of smell is far superior to, to us humans and we have found a way to harness that to our best efforts and that can suit our needs. And that is the success of man's best friend utilizing in all walks of life. Ichikovitz notes that it is important to create scenarios during the training that might permeate during a poaching attempt in order for the handlers and the dogs to be prepared. So you simulate the ambush tactic to, to, to teach the handlers and the dogs how to actually set up an active engagement situation in a poaching environment where, where you might have anti-poaching patrols 
forcing a poacher into an environment where you've set up blocking forces in advance of the actual poacher and they push the poacher into the ambush environment so that they can effect an arrest on that poacher. Well the helicopter training is vital, so the helicopter teaches the dog not to be afraid of the noise of a helicopter as well as how to rapidly deploy from a helicopter by abseiling or, or, or deploying out of a helicopter down a rope into a bush environment so that it can then rapidly get into onto the trail of a poacher and arrest the poacher. Running a successful training academy has meant that the dogs and the handlers can be deployed anywhere in Africa upon completion of the training. Ostaisen mentions where the dogs have been deployed to in Africa. Well, we have dogs deployed all over uh, reserves in South Africa as well as in the rest of Africa. Unfortunately, I can't elaborate more in the uh, specific clientele, but it, it's all over the continent. Other news making headlines this week, Gauteng's Premier declares an open door policy for businesses and South Africa's R&D expenditure is not yet on target. In a move to entice the private sector to buy into the province's overarching 10-pillar transformation, modernization and reindustrialization strategy, Gauteng Premier David Makura has declared an open door policy to businesses wishing to engage with the provincial cabinet. I made a commitment in June that uh, we are going to consult extensively with uh, various sectors of society in the province to build consensus. And that consensus will be on the 10 pillars of our program for transformation, modernization and reindustrialization that uh, the program director has eloquently talked about, what we call the TMR. While South Africa improved its spending on research and development, or R&D, during 2012-13 and halted the worrying contractions experienced in 2009-10 and 2010-11, the nation had failed to achieve its years-long target of spending 1% of gross domestic product on R&D. Uh, this uh, survey shows that the outlook for R&D uh, investment in the country is improving. Many of you would be aware that we have had a contraction following uh, the uh, economic crisis impact on our R&D investment, uh, both in our country as well as in the global uh, uh, research performing uh, uh, countries. The years 2009-10 and 2010-11 were particularly difficult years in which we marked this uh, uh, very worrying uh, contraction. But uh, we are very excited that we are now noting an improvement through the results we present to you for 2012-13. That's Crema Media's Real Economy Report. Join us again next time for more news and insight into South Africa's real economy.